Aloha Kako. Welcome and good evening. My name is James Eustace and I'm the president of the Waimea Community Association. Thank you to those joining us online tonight and welcome back to our virtual candidate forum series leading up to the general election on November 3rd. Tonight, we are joined by the two candidates seeking your vote for Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Hawaii Island Trustee. I encourage you to follow the Waimea Community Association on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. You may also find relevant information and resources up on our website at waimeatown.org. We strive to keep our accounts active and up to date. At this point, I would like to recognize the Waimea Community Association board members. Our Vice President, Michael Donnelly, our Treasurer, Louis Dubois, our Secretary, Frankie Pang, our Assistant Secretary, Patty Cook, and our Directors, Nancy Carr-Smith, Riley Smith, Lonnie Olson Chong, David Greenwell, and Llewellyn Kumalai. The Waimea Community Association Board is grateful for the support shown by the community to hold virtual town meetings. Earlier this year, we held a series of virtual forums leading up to the Hawaii State primary election in August and have continued to hold monthly town meetings in this virtual setting. And last week, we held a virtual forum with the two candidates seeking a seat of Hawaii County Council District 1. Thank you all for your interest in joining us, those li those, us live those past evenings and for viewing and sharing the recordings. You are welcome to revisit and rewatch those videos either up on the WCA Facebook page or up on our WCA YouTube channel. The Waimea Community Association is a nonprofit organization that strives to promote open participation by all of the Waimea community, develop leadership, and support the smart growth of the region. If you'd like to support the Waimea Community Association and the work that we have done and help continue our effort in connecting with our community, you are more than welcome to donate and join as a member. If this is something that interests you and you would like to receive more information, uh, please email us at waimeacommunityassociation at gmail.com or visit our website at waimeatown.org to download a membership form. And then you are welcome to mail these forms and your annual dues to the Waimea Community Association at PO Box 2622, Kamala Hawaii 96743. This information and more can be found on our website, waimeatown.org. And your contributions and membership allow us to reach out and connect with the community in this setting and support the work that WCA has done over the past 60 years. Mahalo. Before we move into the main portion of tonight's meeting, I would like to take a moment to present you, our viewers, with some information related to the upcoming general election on Tuesday, November 3rd. Once again, this important election will be determined by you and Hawaii State residents through the mail ballot process as we experienced in the Hawaii State primary election. So as I said, the general election is Tuesday, November 3rd, and we'll be voting by mail once again. Now, the voting by mail process, uh, you might wanna make sure that you're registered and you wanna reconfirm or even update your voter registration. This is the website you would have used. However, the deadline to register for the general election ended on uh, Monday, October 5th, just this past Monday, but you still can go to a voter service center uh, later on uh, when, they, when they start opening to register in person. And our ballots will be in the mail in a couple days here. They were mailed out by the County General Elections Office uh, just, just yesterday, actually, from my understanding. And you should be receiving them any day now. Uh, voters should receive their ballot packets by towards the end of next week. And if you do not, for whatever reason, uh, please do contact the Hawaii County Elections Division and their phone number is there for you. You can even reach out to the State Office of Elections. And there's a toll-free number for Hawaii Island there. Uh, it's also been recommended that you mail back your completed ballot in a timely manner if you're deciding to use the United States Postal Service. And so make sure the date there is Tuesday, October 27th. That's kind of like that cutoff date uh, recommended to mail back your ballots. And it's important to note that all voted ballots must be received by the clerk's office no later than 7 p.m. on election day. Excuse me.
And now as we approach uh, uh, the general election day, ballot drop, excuse me, secure ballot drop boxes will be opened. And I believe they're starting to open up pretty soon here. Um, so next looks like next week they'll be opening up. And these are those eight locations on the Big Island where you can drop your ballot, your completed ballot packets off. We even have one in here, Waimea, at the Waimea Police Station. Um, and I recommend using these if you would like to mail it back after that deadline of October 27th through the Postal Service. So these are there for you to use as well. Now, as I mentioned, the voter service centers are our facilities that to provide accessible in-person voting, same-day voter registration, and the collection of those voted ballots. You can even collect them, you receive them in the mail, and you could turn it in at a voter service center once you've completed it there. Uh, the voter service centers are open 10 business days prior to the election, and they will even be open on election day. And their hours are there posted for you. Uh, they will start opening up on October 20th and continue to the 2nd of November. Uh, those days are Monday through Saturday, and they're not open on Sundays, and their hours are from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And then on election day, they'll be open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The two locations we have on the Big Island are the Hawaii County Building in Hilo and the West Y Civic Center in Kona. And most importantly, you know, we want to make sure that your vote counts. So turn over your ballot, make sure you're voting on both sides of the ballot. Uh, you also must sign the outside of your return mail-in envelope as part of a voter security protocol. And you, lastly, as I mentioned before, please be sure to return your ballot in on time. And as I said before, Tuesday, October 27th, if you want to use the United States Postal Service, is that recommended cutoff date? Or always you can drop it off at a ballot drop box or bring it to a voter service center there. Um, Hawaii residents may walk in, register to vote on election day at the voter service center. So if you'd like to do that or you have not registered, you can still do so at the voter service center. But please be sure to present your Hawaii driver's license or a state ID and also have knowledge of your social security number. All this information and more can be found on the elections website, the state office elections website, and that link is there for you, elections.hawaii.gov. And kind of a little bit more about uh, the general election here. If you'd like to learn about all the candidates that are on, you might find on your ballot, the League of Women Voters has the resource available for you at vote411.org, and they have information about the, about the candidates that you can find on your ballots there. Um, and we're grateful that the League of Women Voters also created a guide, a voter information guide to the Hawaii County Charter Amendments. You'll be seeing uh, 16 charter amendments on your ballot. And so it, it's important to learn about those and that information's there. Um, let's see, uh, so it's a nonpartisan guide to these proposed amendments. This guide will help you better understand uh, the amendments by showcasing subject areas, fiscal impact statements, pro and con statements, and links to any pertinent county uh, county charter pages. So this guide, I, we've just added up on our WCA website, so it can also be found up on there under the elections tab. So mahalo to the league members for your effort in creating this uh, guide for our voters. And as I mentioned last week, um, journalist Sherry Bracken uh, spotlighted the charter amendments in her KWXX FM Island Conversations radio podcast, which was about uh, the other weekend now. And now it's going to be found up on the kwxx.com website. And Sherry was joined by legal and voter members to um, kind of present this back and forth and pros and cons of the various amendments. All right. So tonight we're going to be here learning more about uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the, the two candidates uh, seeking your votes um, for Hawaii Island trustee. Now it's important to note that for OHA and this seat in particular, that all the OHA seats, anyone across the state can vote for these. And you don't have to be any, uh, you, anyone can vote for these. All registered voters can vote for in the OHA race and have the opportunity to do so. Um, before we kind of move into the question portion of tonight's forum, I also wanted to give a little bit of background of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to kind of get you to understand a little bit more and what it means to sit on this board and uh, the policy that you're involved with as a, as a trustee. So this comes right from the State of Hawaii Office Elections website. OHA is a public agency governed by a board of trustees and is responsible for setting policy and managing the agency's trust. The board is composed of nine members 
who are elected to serve four-year terms. And uh, as I said before, all voters statewide are allowed to vote in each of the OHA contests. Uh, four of the seats on the board are at-large trustees, and the remaining five seats are resident trustees. So there's one trustee from each of the fallen islands, either Hawaii Island, Maui, and then the Molokai Lanai grouping there, Oahu, and Kauai and Ni'ihau also have a res as a resident trustee. And the qualifications for a trustee, you must be a resident of the respective island for your seats requiring residency, and you must be a registered voter in the state of Hawaii. The goal of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs is to enhance the well-being of Native Hawaiians by collaborating with various organizations in an effort to strengthen community resources. OHA was created at the 1978 State of Hawaii Constitutional Convention to address historical injustices and challenges arising out of those circumstances. And the 1978 delegates envision an agency that provides a form of self-determination for Native Hawaiians and to advocate for their overall well-being. As I mentioned, the OHA Office of Hawaiian Affairs is governed by a board of trustees that is made of nine members, and they serve a four-year term. And the board of trustees is also responsible for appointing their, their CEO, their chief executive op op officer, the Ka Pauhana, to oversee a staff of about 170 people. And some of the background on OHA, it, you know, they provide an annual basis. On an annual basis, they provide college scholarship to Native Hawaiian students. They help Native Hawaiians start their businesses, improve homes, help consolidate debts, and continue, and continue their education through its loan program. And has also aided other Native Hawaiian organizations, including Hawaiian Focused Charter Schools and the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And in advocating for Hawaiian issues, OHA is focused on strategic, the strategic priorities for improving the conditions of Native Hawaiians in the areas of aina, culture, economic self-sufficiency, education, governance, and health. And this advocacy includes, advocacy includes conducting research to guide decisions and empower communities, develop and shape public policies, help to ensure that laws are complied with at the state, local, and fed levels, federal levels, and also working with communities to share information and build public support for Hawaiian issues. And lastly, you know, the Board of Trustees is responsible for setting Office of Hawaiian Affairs policy and managing the agency's trust. The board meets regularly at its headquarters on Oahu, and they at least, they at least once annually meet on one of the ma outer major islands. Uh, each of the trustees sits on the board that they, they stand on two committees. One committee is on the Committee of Resource Management, and the other is on Committee on Beneficiary Advocacy and Empowerment. So I can leave this up there for you. You're also welcome to review this video for more information about this here. But I've taken a bit of your time there, so I, I thank you for that and kind of giving you some background information on the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and some information there. So at this time, I'd like to open up our screen so that our viewers can view all of our guests on the call this evening. Uh, we are grateful to uh, both of the candidates, Mr. Kiola Lindsay and Mr. Lanakila Manguel, for joining us tonight. Over the course of this hour, the next hour here, we will be hearing statements and asking the candidates questions generated by community members. And before the start of the live stream, we, we determined the candidates order in which they would present and answer the questions. The candidates will begin this evening by giving a two minute self introduction. And after the self introduction, candidates will then be asked a series of questions. And we hope that the questions asked of the candidates during this forum series better inform your decision during the election process. And if you'd like to learn more specifics about these candidates, I would encourage you to reach out to them directly or to their campaigns. Thank you for taking the time to submit your questions to the Waimea Community Association and for helping to make this, this forum a community-driven effort. We have assigned a specific amount of time for each of the questions, and candidates may, yet, may use up to that predetermined time, and a bell will sound if they go over their time. Candidates will be rotating their order throughout the evening as the questions are presented to them. And we will tackle as many questions as we're able to. And towards the end of tonight's forum, we will give the candidates two minutes to present closing remarks. And tonight, I'm also grateful to be joined by two of our Waimea Community Association board members, Lonnie Olson Chong and Riley Smith. They will be assisting me in presenting questions to the candidates. 
But so at this time, um, I'd like to start off our virtual forum uh, this evening as we hear from the candidates running for Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Hawaii Island trustee uh, to the floor. Uh, we'll begin by asking Mr. Manguel, Mr. Lanikila Manguel, to begin with his two minutes of introduction. So Lanikila, when you begin speaking, I will start your time. Aloha ahi ahi kako, o wau o Joshua Lanakilo o kaaina i kapono mengwau. Um, I am born and raised right over in Honoka'a. Um, I actually grew up just mauka in the area of Ahualoa. I am the son of uh, Stephen Mengwau of Kailua Kona and Marine Louise McGraw, uh, originally from Colorado. Um, I am very, very honored to be able to come and share with you all today. Um, being raised right in Honoka'a, of course, Waimea right up the street. So um, uh, it's, it's an honor to be able to work with my community. Um, I am a graduate of Kanoka Aina, uh, the native, very first Native Hawaiian public charter school. I graduated in 2004. Um, I'm a proud product of that, that renaissance and that revolution of, of Hawaiian-based education. Um, they really rooted um, our understanding and connectivity to world history and understanding our environment and our, our past and our futures. Uh, from the foundation of who we are as a people as Kanaka Maoli and the history of these lands in parallel with the world. Um, so with that, very blessed to have a very wide perspective, um, especially with our journeys, uh, being, being allowed to journey across the world and learn with many different people through many different um, avenues. Um, after graduating high school, I attended Hawaii Community College for a time and actually simultaneously became a teacher. Um, I began teaching back at Kanoka Aina as well as became the Hawaiian Studies teacher for Honoka Elementary, Intermediate, and High School, where I served for over a decade teaching there. Um, and it's been a wonderful thing getting to, to help to malama and raise our next generation and now seeing them as adults. Um, you know, and I've been part of this community. I've never left my community. Uh, this is my foundation. Um, I've done many things as well as working with our, helping to establish the Hamakua Youth Center a number of years ago. And just a few years ago, well, uh, 2016 established the Hawaiian Cultural Center of Hamakua, where we continue to advocate for uh, cultural um, education and, and uh, to help set a firm foundation for our communities. Mahalo. Mahalo Lanakila, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, next up, I'd like to welcome Mr. Kila Lindsay to the floor for his two minute self introduction. Kila, time is yours when you start. Aloha and mahalo to the Community Association for the opportunity tonight and for all the viewers um, who have um, signed in to follow along. And aloha to fellow, my fellow candidate, um, Lanakila. Um, you know, I, I'm proud to be a product of, you know, Waimea and Pu'ukapu Hawaiian Homestead. Um, I never knew my grandparents, but from what I've heard from them and the values that I've seen passed down, you know, my grandma was all about education, family, and working hard. And the story I've been told is that my grandfather, at his funeral at Imiola Church, it was standing room only because everybody in Waimea was his friend. Um, and I like to think that those values um, are carried through into Waimea Town and my family today. Um, you know, my dad and mom and dad worked very hard to provide for us. Um, they made the decision to send me to HPA when I was ready for middle school and high school. And it was kind of a shock for me because my bags are packed to be a Honoka'a Dragon. But um, that was the decision, you know, they made for me. You know, they worked very hard. You know, my dad cut Kiave posts and pick Palapalai Fern and Honokaia Forest to send me there. Um, there were challenges, but you know, um, a lot of the people I met there are still my friends to this day. Um, and that you know, didn't make me any better than anyone or anyone who didn't go on that path, but it definitely set me on a course to where I am today. Um, I started my career in state government, you know, working here on Hawaii Island, um, dealing um, with State Historic Preservation Division. And I've had the opportunity for nearly two decades now um, to work with communities across Hawaii on many issues. Um, and now as a father and a son living here in Kauai, preparing for that kuleana, um, I feel like I've earned the um, opportunity and I'm prepared for the opportunity to be considered for this position. Mahalo. Mahalo kia ora. Appreciate your time. And once again, thank you for joining us this evening. For this next portion of tonight's agenda, 
Um, I'm going to be welcoming our two YMA Community Association board members that are joining me, and they'll be presenting the community-generated questions. And once again, candidates will be rotating the order in which they respond. The presenters will also state the amount of time allotted for each question, and the candidates will each be given up to that amount of time to share their response. Lonnie and Riley, I will now pass the floor over to you for this next portion. Mahalo. All right, <clears throat> Mahalo James, uh, aloha. This is Riley Smith, uh, director on the Waimea Community Association Board. Um, welcome Mr. Lindsay and Mr. Bangwell. Uh, if you guys are cool with it, I was gonna refer to each of you as Keola and Lanakila. Um, thank you for running for public office and making a significant personal commitment to serving our community and island. And thank you for joining us this evening. Our goal is to give constituents and the wider community an opportunity to get to know each of you better, to understand your vision, priorities, and personal areas of expertise that you would bring to serving as a trustee for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, specifically in the role representing Hawaii Island. We hope this opportunity will help voters make a more informed decision in the general election on or before Tuesday, November 3rd. As a reminder, candidates will rate, rotate turns as we move through the questions. We will also state the amount of time we are allotting for each of the questions. So on to the first question, and this regards why vote for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. It's a 90 second uh, question. We're gonna be starting with Keola. So Keola, let me tell you the question and then you can answer it. And when the time uh, expires and then we'll have Lana Keela answer the same question. When Lani goes forward, she'll rotate the order so that it's uh, you equally have an opportunity to answer question first and second. So this is the first question. There were over 180,000, 183,000 blank votes in the August 2020 Hawaii primary election for Hawaii Island trustee for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the seat you are running for. Despite it being a crowded race with 11 candidates, Waimea Community Association decided to hold tonight's virtual forum because we think it is an important race, but why were there so many blank ballots? So, Keola, that's the first question to you. Why, why do you think there were so many blank ballots? Well, I think it's a combination, Mahalo Riley. I think it's a combination of a couple of factors. Um, many people still don't know that all registered voters in Hawaii can vote for OHA. I believe some people um, who may not be of Native Hawaiian descent make a conscious decision um, not to vote in the OHA races. And I think the combination of registered voters in Hawaii, both Native Hawaiian and, and non-Native Hawaiian, um, maybe don't cast votes, not only for OHA, but for many um, offices, because they've lost um, confidence and, and faith that their um, voices are being heard and that their voices matter. Um, and I would say that the, your people's voters' voices do matter. People should be very informed on all the issues and all the um, races that they'll be casting their votes on. And when, when it comes to OHA, of course, it's important to understand OHA's mission and mandate to serve the Native Hawaiian community. But I think it's important for all voters to realize that the work OHA does does impact all of Hawaii. When we're advocating in schools, um, DOE, DOE schools, you know, 25% of the DOE population is Native Hawaiian, but 75% isn't. And I think that's a good example of how the work that OHA does in the DOE and across Hawaii impacts not only Native Hawaiians, but all of our community and people should vote. Mahalo. Okay, thank you very much, Keola. Uh, Lana Keela, next to you, um, if you'd like me to repeat the question, uh, basically it's, why do you think there were so many blank ballots in the August primary election? Lana Keela. Thank you. Um, you know, I can only echo uh, the, the historical facts that um, Keola had also just pointed out there. You know, it is, um, I think it's important to note too that and when OHA was originally formed, um, it was only for Native Hawaiians to vote. Um, that was challenged um, in, when was it, the, the, the late 90s in the uh, Rice versus Cayetano case that um, that was ruled. Uh, it went up to Supreme Court and then uh, that was changed and it became um, open to any, uh, anybody. Um, so I think there is, there is the, the, the sense of, of education or, or um, 
the sense of you know, many people feel that it, it's not their koleana, especially for our non-native Hawaiian population, feels that it's not their responsibility and not to, uh, out of respect, don't want to intrude on that. And I think that is actually a very real question that perhaps needs to be looked at again, as many people express that they don't want to be partaking that. Um, uh, but it does, it, it very much is a fact that yes, what happens with OHA um, does affect the greater community, but yet OHA does, is, as Kuleana is to, primary beneficiary is the Kanaka Maoli, uh, the Native Hawaiian population. So I think it is a conversation that we have to, uh, we have to continue to have in our communities. Um, is it uh, something for everyone to participate in this vote? But as it stands right now, it is. So all we, the best we can do is continue to educate our community and have these forms and discussions that you are hosting right now, share with our community and the broader community of the responsibility of this office. Um, and yeah. So, yeah. All right. Mahalo, Lanikila. I think you're peeking at the next follow-up question here. So um, again, this is, this is a related but different question. We're gonna go again in the same order. So Keola then Lanikila. So the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was created by constitutional amendment in 1978. At that time, only Hawaiians could vote for Office of Hawaiian Affairs trustee candidates. In 1999, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down that provision of state law via the Freddie Rice decision. I think many of you, both of you probably know Freddie, um, resident, former resident of Waimea. Anyway, the outcome of that lawsuit was that all residents of the state of Hawaii were given the opportunity to vote for Office of Hawaiian Affairs trustees. So this is the question, what is OHA, OHA's fundamental mission and should non-Hawaiians vote in the OHA elections? Starting with you, Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo, so OHA's fundamental mission from um, the constitution is to work towards the betterment of Hawaiians and oversee how other agencies, whether they're at the county, state or federal levels, um, are supporting native Hawaiian interests as well. Um, and when those agencies don't, it's OHA's job to take action, um, whether it's corrective or advocacy, um, to change that or try to affect that in a better way. And of course, OHA has its own set of programs to fulfill our mission um, through our grant programs, our Native Hawaiian Revolving Loan Fund, et cetera. Um, I guess I'll build on my answer to the previous question and say, um, to me, there's no doubt that while OHA's mission and mandate is for the betterment of Native Hawaiian people, the work we do in the community benefits all of Hawaii. When we're providing grant funding to Native Hawaiian focused charter schools, um, of course, I don't know the breakdown, but some of that population is Native Hawaiian, but some of them are not. Um, DOE advocacy, when we're working to protect historic sites and have our oceans clean, and access to resources. While the focus is on Native Hawaiians, um, everyone benefits from a clean ocean, a fully operating DOE, um, good charter schools, etc. So OHA's work benefits Native Hawaiians and all of Hawaii. Mahalo. Riley, if you want to unmute yourself there, please. That's okay. But, uh, <laughs> let me repeat the question, Lana Kila. Uh, what is OHA's fundamental mission and should non-Hawaiians vote in the OHA elections? Uh, Lana Kila, you have 90 seconds. I think it's a great education to everybody of, of what this office deserves. So I can only echo um, uh, what, what Keola mentioned there of the part of the Kuleana of, 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 of OHA. But I, I encourage everybody to also remember if you look, if you saw um, in the creation of OHA, um, OHA was also created uh, to address the injustices. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's very important. So that's part of its advocacy work to continue to help take care of the community as we are living now, but also the responsibility to take care of the past uh, transgressions. Um, and, and if you're not sure what that is, I encourage everyone to look into the Hawaiian history as to what are these uh, what are these past injustices. And so it's also the responsibility of OHA to, to ho'opono and to, to work and hold the state accountable to these uh, these past transgressions, which we are continuing to advocate for. And you see Kanaka Maoli and um, uh, uh, Native Hawaiian people advocating uh, 
um, <clears throat> for justice, it's because we have these past uh, transgressions. But again, as I say too, you know, what is good for Kanaka is good for everybody. Um, many look at a lot of the, the things that Hawaiians are fighting for. We want affordable housing. I think we all do. We need. We want to make sure that our waters are protected, that our, our watersheds and our native animals, and that we have access uh, to um, to to healthy resources. I think we all benefit from that. And it's just a. It's very much is the responsibility because who we are as a people, as being here for so many generations, we are this aina. This aina is us, and we want to hold them out this tradition. All right. Thank you very much, Lani Kila. Uh, next group of questions will be handled by Lani. Uh, Lani, go ahead. Mahalo, James and Riley. Aloha, Keola and Lani Kila. The next question has to do with familiarity and responsibilities. Please share more about your experience and interaction with OHA. Please highlight why you decided to seek this elected position. 90 seconds, Lani Kila first. Um, you know, I could say probably I can reflect back to some of my first personal experience with Ojai as being um, a product of the charter schools. Um, one, one of the disadvantages or challenges that the charter schools have is that we don't receive, uh, though it is, a, it is still a public school, each student only receives a fraction of the amount as students receive in a, a regular DOE school. So OHA has been there to help to support our charter schools from its inception. And myself coming from Kanoka Aina, which was the very first of this, um, I remember we were, we were educated as to what our charter school was and this new dynamic thing. And we participated in dialogue and sharing. And I myself as a student went and, and um, spoke at OHA meetings to share about my experience. Um, so, so feeling and seeing that, it was very interesting for myself growing up consciously in this, in this uh, discussion to also hear some of the things that, uh, that there was a lot of bitterness uh, with our community in OHA yet we see some benefits, yet we see that bitterness. So I, I think it's very important that we, we acknowledge these things that OHA is meant to do. And I think what or I, where I decide to step in is to also see, um, <clears throat> to help to, to bring the community and OHA back together. There has been a lot of transgressions in the past that have really split the community and, and a lack of trust within that office. Um, and things that I haven't agreed with myself and things that I've, I've really strongly supported. So I think what's important is that when the, when the office is meant to serve, the beneficiaries are not communicating, that we need to bring that together and I hope to do that. Uh -huh. Mahalo la nakila. Keola, do you need me to repeat the question? No. 90 seconds, go ahead. Mahalo. So, you know, my earliest connection with OHA is when my parents, um, when they were farming, um, they got a loan from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to buy equipment and support um, the operations of their farm. And I'll always remember my dad saying, you know, as Hawaiians, you know, we're not stereotypes and we work hard. And when we're given an opportunity, we make the most of it. And it meant a lot to my mom and dad to get that small loan. And it meant a lot for their business. And, you know, I always remember that opportunity. Um, and I, as I've moved forward um, through life and my career, um, I, I've, I've actually worked on the OHA administration side um, for 13 years now. Um, I've started at an at a entry-level position and worked hard to be qualified and, and move my way up through there. And I've seen a lot of things and I understand the processes um, I've seen the good work, um, but I also know that OHA can do better and our community needs them now, us now more than ever. Um, and we can do more. And the simple formula for OHA is the more resources that come into OHA, the more resources OHA can put out for Native Hawaiian programs and community programs um, to make things better in our communities. And that's one thing I'm really committed to, listening, and working with all stakeholders to see those benefits happen. Mahalo. Mahalo, Keola. Back to Riley. All right. Thank you, Lani. On to our next question. This is a, a 90 second question. It regards OHA's strategic priorities. OHA has an updated strategic plan with six strategic priorities. They include AINA, culture, economic self sufficiency, education, governance, and health. What will be the two priorities you will focus on and how will you approach these issues? 
Please be specific and share with us why and how this will benefit Waimea and Hawaii Island. Again, we're going to start with Keola. Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo. So my, part two, my top two priorities are education and economic stability for Native Hawaiians. Um, and I define both. I'll, I, I, for me personally, I add sovereignty onto the end of both of those. Education sovereignty and economic sovereignty for Native Hawaiians. OHA and Native Hawaiians overall are already kind of well established in the indigenous um, people's world of being a leader in education with our Hawaiian language schools and Native Hawaiian focused uh, charter schools. Um, I believe OHA can continue to support that through our grant funding, which we provide a significant amount of money to and supporting changes in legislative processes um, for those education, educational initiatives. For economic stability, I believe OHA really has to start identifying industries ahead of time that are gonna be beneficial for our community and Native Hawaiians and get our people in a position to get the good paying jobs to support their families in those industries whether it's alternative industry, I mean, sorry, alternative energy, high technology, some of the existing industries like agriculture and a new form of tourism. We have to identify where Native Hawaiians can um, make the most impact, but also um, provide for their families um, and a better way of life. Mahalo. All right, thank you very much, Keola. Uh, Lanakila, moving on to you, just let me repeat a uh, portion of the question. What are your two priorities and be specific and share with us why and how this will benefit Waimea and Hawaii Island? Lanakila, 90 seconds. Um, <clears throat> no, I think what's key here is Aina and economic stability. Um, and I'm gonna, I have to add one more in there because I think the key to both of that is education. And not only education in our primary schools, but educate full community education. Uh, what's very, very important right now is as well as what we are trying to uh, deal with, with you know, that's been exacerbated by COVID situations is we've had a lot of other issues that we've been trying to, to, to get a hold on uh, prior to that. Um, addressing global climate change, environmental degradation, and the loss of jobs. We need to marry these two concepts together that we need to help to not only wait uh, to try and receive these jobs, but also create this, these, this, these industries that actually help to, to malamara aina and restore our, our natural environment. Um, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of, of amazing new technology that is coming out as well that can help that I think that if we truly focus this technology advancement towards the benefit of taking care of our natural environment, uh, then it's a win-win. Uh, a discussion I've been having in many different circles is a concept of uh, bringing together um, from our universities and reaching out across with education and, and building partnerships to create an AINA-based education system um, that is truly uh, connected to the world and this concept of um, earth-saving technologies. I think that's a key thing that the whole planet and everyone can benefit from right here. And again, our culture here is rooted in that and what best way to do that, but to educating our, our communities and our children. All right. Mahalo, Lani Kila. Lani, back to you. Mahalo, Riley. This one has to do with economy, which you've touched on a little bit, Lani Kila. Considering the destructive health, economic and social impacts of COVID-19, how would you through your position as an OHA trustee support and create opportunities for Native Hawaiians to recover and improve their economic well-being. Please provide specific examples. 90 seconds. Lanakila? You know, I think one of the first things that's very important is to recognize that OHA is also sits in a position and, and a responsibility of governance. And I, for me, governance isn't just a necessarily a, a, or can play the role of being the, the table to bring the conversations. And I think it's very important that OHA use it and leverage its assets and stuff to also bridge um, all of our Native Hawaiian trusts. There are many, much lands and resources available through all of our Hawaiian trusts. And we're talking billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of acres. There's so much land and, and, and assets to help to, that could be brought together to help to create and localize our essentials. 
I think it's one of the biggest things that COVID showed it, uh, the weaknesses of our economy is that we were completely unsustainable. We, we have the means to be sustainable, but we aren't, we aren't supporting that. Um, so I think to help bridge and leverage the assets to help to set up the infrastructure necessary within our own communities to feed ourselves, um, I think that's quite essential. Um, and in that, that helps to stimulate a local economy so that when we do slowly open up again for tourism, that you know, we help to centralize the, the cost so we're not having to, to ship so much things in, into Hawaii and then also our funds that come in from outside having to go right back out. We localize that, we help, and we can do that through many different means using Hawaiian lands, uh, OHA lands, or working with DHHL um, or other assets such as that. Mahalo, Lanakila. Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo. So, in the near future, OHA's main role as, as a state agency is making sure the unprecedented, unprecedented amount of federal funding that is coming into Hawaii for COVID relief is getting into the Native Hawaiian community. Um, we absolutely have to be doing that in the short term. Um, moving forward, as we look at recovery from COVID, um, we need to start looking at uh, building upon existing industries like agriculture. 60% um, or so of agriculture activities happen on Hawaii Island. In Waimea alone, we know that Many of the big agriculture farms um, are, you know, the gen next generation isn't taking over. Um, it's an industry that's in decline. How are we going to help that recover? What incentives and what support can, does agriculture need? Um, and that includes ranching. Um, we need to hear from those folks and support that recovery. When we look down on the coast, um, tourism, what is the new form of tourism going to be? Um, we know that was record visitors, declining economy. And last, initiatives like um, internet connectivity and alternative energy are industries that we should be looking into and supporting our folks getting good jobs in them. Mahalo. Mahalo, Keola. Back to Riley. All right. Thank you very much, Alani. Uh, next question uh, concerns health. And we're going to start with Keola. It's a 90 second question. Well before the COVID pandemic hit, Office of Hawaiian Affairs identified statewide consensus around the urgent need to improve Native Hawaiian health. Please share your personal priorities related to improved health care for Native Hawaiians. Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo. So again, it's ensuring that the, the funds designated for Native Hawaiian serving um, organizations are received from both the federal government and state government to continue supporting their programs. Um, OHA can also look at the targeted grant funding that we do to health um, serving organizations um, to continue that and really provide the benefits to um, communities. Um, but in a bigger sense, you know, I think we should really think big and look, forward, look towards the future where um, the biggest challenge, uh, challenge our people have, and we've seen it happen with COVID, is that the loss of employment means the loss of health benefits, or some employers don't even provide health benefits to begin with. And it's going to be a challenge, and there's going to be some work to do. But, you know, I look forward to a day where there is um, regular and consistent health insurance, health insurance, and health coverage um, for Native Hawaiians, you know, and their family and families. And some of that goes back to, we need to get the revenue coming into the Native Hawaiian community so that big programs like that can be funded. And the basic health needs that our people need can be met through existing programs and service providers, or if they wanna go to conventional um, service providers like Waimea Hospital, they have insurance. Mahalo. All right. Thank you very much, Keola. Uh, moving on to Lanakila, the same question. Please share your personal priorities related to improved health care for Native Hawaiians. Um, definitely, again, OHA has the ability to leverage these funds and to help to work with the state um, to advocate for both uh, state and federal funds uh, to secure the, the, 
um, healthcare. But I've always been a, a, a an, an advocate for, to try and find a way to to try to centralize or um, create that universal healthcare system, um, even if it means uh, within the Native Hawaiian community. Originally, Queen's Hospital actually was basically designed in that way until the trust was overhauled and that we lost that ability um, or they, they gave up that universal health care for Native Hawaiians as the Queen established that in her will. Um, <clears throat> so the means are there uh, to, to try and, and uh, solve the health insurance question. Uh, it's the will. Yeah, you know, a lot of things that's holding that back are, of course, different conglomerates that hold the power and hold the resources. Um, so I'm also, again, education is key. I've been working in schools for a long time. And, you know, I think what prevention, health uh, prevention of sicknesses is very important. We need to work with, again, I think there's added benefits to just localizing our economy um, and agriculture and food and such. It's not just about economics it's about the health benefits that actually come with that and to actually raise our community and our children in an understanding of of holistic health of being connected with the environment caring for environment and reflecting that health onto this onto self um, so i think there's a lot of work to be done in education and helping to educate our communities in being healthy as well as working uh, within these institutions thank you very much uh, this is a follow-up question 60 second question uh, Waimea, and we're going to start with Kiola. Waimea is fortunate to have two federally qualified health care centers, including Kipuko o Keola or Koko and Hamakua Kohala Health, and even Queens North Hawaii Community Hospital, which prioritizes Native Hawaiian health. Is OHA currently working with any of these organizations or others to improve access and affordability? Starting with you, Keola. So I believe, you know, at a, at a high level in terms of the federal funding that these organizations, you know, receive, we work closely um, with our con congressional delegation to ensure that funding continues to come in um, to, de to develop programs at both of those institutions. Um, and I think moving forward, um, OHA should develop a relationship and clear line of communication with both of those organizations at the ground level and on a day-to-day -day basis to understand what their needs are and how we can further help. Um, they're the direct service providers. They're the healthcare experts. Um, and that's a good example of there's gonna be times where OHA will be in a support role as opposed to a lead role um, and perhaps look at grant funding to supplement the federal funding both of them get to continue providing those needed and important benefits to our communities. Mahalo. All right, thank you, Kiola. Uh, Lanakila, same question to you. Is OHA currently working with any of these organizations or others to improve access and affordability to healthcare? Um, I'll be honest, um, in this note, um, as not working in the office yet, I am not completely um, uh, up to par of understanding exactly the direct uh, relationships that the office is holding, but I do echo the, that it is imperative that they, they definitely should be maintaining that, uh, maintaining relationships and only building upon these relationships as a support. Um, OHA itself is not a healthcare system, so it's a, the primary role is how can it be of assistance to. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, one particular with the Queens, uh, Queens Hospital basically is also funded out of the trusts. Um, and I think to be able to, to in some cases, as well as trying to help bring those assets in from the feds um, and state, uh, we are we're looking back again to the, the funds that come in from the, uh, the Queen's Trust lands and being able to keep that alive to continue to maintain a, a, a localized source of, of, of funding for the hospitals as well. All right. Thank you, Lani Kila. Uh, Lani, your turn. Mahalo. This one has to do with education. The need for improved lifelong educational opportunities for Native Hawaiians is another of OHA's recognized strategic priorities. Share your thoughts about what OHA is already doing or should be doing about enhanced educational opportunities for beneficiaries. 90 seconds, Lanakila. 
Um, I can only speak to again uh, some of my own experience of, of seeing that they um, one thing the investment of in our local charter schools many of our charter schools um, they host a lot of community education beyond just their their K to or preschool to 12th grade. Um, Kanoka Aina for one also continues a lot of um, as was always deemed womb to tomb education and making that ability. Um, uh, um, that making that available to the community. Uh, the support for Native Hawaiian language programs all around, and as well as its uh, working relationships with um, uh, Hawaiians, uh, Hawaiian studies programs is, is quite paramount, but I think also helping to uh, seeing what OHA does in its um, scholarship programs is, is beneficial I, uh, and, and good. I think it should only be increased to offer more um, scholarships for our, uh, supporting our local students and for as well as our, our um, uh, the, the general population and helping to to host more educational opportunities within our communities. Mahalo, Lana Kila. Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo. So again, some of the, the basic actions OHA is doing is um, grant funding for charter schools, funding for uh, college scholarship opportunities, um, but there's also other activities um, like um, conducting advocacy at the state legislature on bills that are affecting education um, and working closely with the Office of Native Hawaiian Education, which is in within the DOE. Um, but I also look at education and that idea of lifelong learning as being beyond, you know, the, the conventional um, pre pre K through high school to college degrees, you know, bachelors in advance, as important as those are. We also need to be providing our people opportunities for, you know, certificates, um, qualifications for jobs, um, all of those kind of things um, that could make the difference, you know, for our people getting a job and not getting a job or, you know, moving up, getting a license, right, a CDL license or some sort of other certification for our people. Um, so I see it as the full breadth of conventional education, but also those other opportunities that are really going to be key for our people to get the educational requirements um, to get good jobs. And really, at the end of the day, each family, I'll go back to educational sovereignty, each family should be able to choose what educational path they want to go on and be able to get on that path. Mahalo. Mahalo, Keola. Back to Riley. All right, thank you, Lani. Um, we're about halfway through. We're on question number seven, and this one regards community involvement and connectivity. It's a one-minute question. We're going to be starting with Keola. Hawaii Island encompasses many distinct communities. If elected, what will you do to ensure you are consistently connected with, hearing from, and communicating with residents of Waimea and North Hawaii? as well as other parts of the island to more deeply understand the needs, concerns, and achievements of your constituents. Keola? Mahalo. So I think one of OHA's challenges historically has been how we um, provide our people with regular opportunities um, to engage with OHA. For many years, folks thought they had to go to a board meeting on Oahu or reach out to our Oahu office to get their issue addressed or have some sort of action taken. Um, I think OHA has taken steps in recent years to really increase the accessibility of our on-island staff in Kona and Hilo um, to our communities and have be able to have those offices open for folks. You know, as the Hawaii Island trustee, if elected, um, you know, I'm fully committed to providing regular and consistent opportunities beyond the annual meeting that our trustees come here for each year, regular and consistent opportunities um, for folks to come, whether it's a community forum, um, community meetings, not only in Waimea and North Hawaii, but around the island so folks can engage with their OHA office. Mahalo. Thank you, Keola. Uh, same question to you, Lanakila. Let me just repeat part of it. What are you going to be doing to consistently connect with and hearing from communicating with residents of Waimea and North Hawaii, as well as, as other parts of the island to more deeply understand the needs, concerns, and achievements of your constituents? Lanakila? This is definitely a big part of, uh, of 
of why I'm running is to help to increase and open up these doors of communication because yes, that has been a big problem for a long time. Me and this is we in the seat. So we should all be uh, have that access to speak. So I know myself personally living here on the island, um, as well as, as uh, making sure to open up and, and, and attend uh, or make sure that our community knows about the attending meetings. I wish to actually constantly kaapuni kamoku and go around and, and hold um, meetings on the islands, um, as well as using, of course, the technology available to us and, and creating um, easy accessible platforms for community to, to express their concerns, um, to share their ideas, and to really to, to host um, a, a, nor, a regular conversation uh, for different topics. Um, using these tools, we're, getting, we're all getting quite well trained on using this. Um, but just to constantly be an open door and an open ear, especially to my constituents here on Hawaii Island. So. Um. All right, thank you, Lani Kila. Uh, Lani, back to you. Mahalo. This one has to do with commitment, and you have one minute. Do you have, will you be maintaining other employment outside of being a trustee, or will you devote yourself entirely to OHA? Lanakila? Uh, I myself, I am currently the executive director of the Hawaiian Cultural Center of Hamakua. Um, and with that, I'm an, I'm an educator and a teacher. Um, I think I will definitely be continuing that work because it's somewhat a lot of it is bridged you know I, I to be constantly working within my community to be continuing to educate my community um i may have to take a step down from that um, actual position itself uh, to be sure to dedicate to have uh, dedicate more of this time to the office um, but i think um, the work that i've been doing in in my life um goes hand in hand with the kuleana of this office. I've always been a community advocate uh, and an educator. Um, so in a way, I don't think um, I will be having to shift too much because I already do a lot of this work, but now I'll be able to bring this, this dialogue um, uh, directly into the office um, as well as be able to be constant uh, within my community um, and just continue to lift our, our whole lot. Mahalo. Mahalo, Lana Kila. Keola? Mahalo. So I recognize that if elected to this position, um, my number one priority will be fulfilling um, the responsibilities of the office and making sure I'm hearing from all stakeholders um, and doing the, the work of the office. Um, so to answer part of that question in terms of other employment, um, I don't think I'm going to take other, I will not take any other appointment that conflicts with that. Um, I'm at a point where I want to start doing more work on our family farm and helping my dad there, um, getting produce going. And, you know, we have avocados and a greenhouse and want to start getting things going there. So that might be an economic opportunity for our family, but it would be self-employment that I wouldn't see as conflicting at all um, with my work at OHA. Mahalo. Mahalo, Keola. Back to Riley. All right. Thank you, Lani. Uh, this is a two-minute question, and I think according to the Civil Beat article we've read recently, uh, might be a distinction but, but between the two of you. Uh, so we're going to again start with Kiola. Uh, just this week, one of Waimea's two, in regards astronomy and Mauna Kea, just the, this week, one of Waimea's two major astronomy organizations is credited with conducting the research that won a Nobel Prize in physics. Yet astronomy on this island and the 30 meter telescope are perhaps the most hot button issues for our island. What is your position on TMT and why? Starting with Keola. Mahalo. So as stated in the Civil Beat article, maybe I used the wrong word, but I'm, I'm, I'm neutral on the project. And the reason I've developed that position is based on my candidacy for OHA as OHA is a state agency, what is the best role for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs to find a way forward for that project to a conclusion? If OHA supports the TMT, will it be built tomorrow? No. If we oppose it, will the project stop and will all the telescopes disappear? No. Um, we need to be there for beneficiaries on both sides of this issue um, to understand what the concerns are, if there have been violations of law, and I'll note that it, this, this project's already gone through 
the state Supreme Court. But OHA's role is if, if something has been missed, if there's violations of, of law, we, we will take action. Um, but we need to be standing there um, in support of, of our beneficiaries and the community on both sides of the issue to try to find a way forward. If we were a decision maker, if we were the final permit approver or whatever you want to call it, of course, OHA would have to take uh, a decision one way or the other. But right now as a non-decision maker and in, in alignment with our mandate to serve all Hawaiians, we need to be there to understand how to find a pathway forward. And when you look at the larger management of Mauna Kea, OHA has already filed a lawsuit against the state of Hawaii seeking to resolve that issue. Um, and that process is working its way through the courts. So I feel OHA is looking at the big picture issue of management and I support OHA's lawsuit there. But as the TMT project in, in particular, with beneficiaries and community on both sides of the issue, and as a non-decision maker, we need to help find all sides find a way forward. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Keola. Uh, Lanikila, same question to you. What is your position on TMT and why? Um, I think there's no secret of my position here, but I think what's very important to note is that there is a there's a distinct difference on on my personal position and then what the position of OHA. I know in my role um, as a trustee and, and and for the office itself, it should be um, serve the kuleana to, of course, as it is mandated to serve all of its beneficiaries, and there are beneficiaries on either side of this of this discussion. My personal um, stance though is I do not support the building of any type of construction project um, within the middle of conservation lands on the very end of Vahipana, um, especially when history and um, past studies have already shown that it's already, already been greatly degraded. I, can't con I cannot support that. Um, <clears throat> but I think um, it is important to note that it is it, having a your own position on something does not exclude you from the conversation. In fact, anything at, uh, back in 2016, prior to that, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs had actually taken a position to support the TMT and there was no support coming to those who, 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 who opposed the project. I actually helped lead, I led a march on OHA that got the, the office to actually rescind its support. And then now as it sits um, in this neutral position where it's now able to pursue things such as the current lawsuits would I support. Um, it, but, you know, I think it's important to know my character um, that though I might have a very strong opinion, uh, my own personal opinion, I've always been one to, to continue communication. I've worked, you know, very closely and I'm always willing to, to, have, to have leads to have those tough discussions. Sometimes I'm the only one that has the discussion. I've, I've met, I've had some great friends that I've met over this and with all we have differing opinions, we get along. Doug Simons, we have dinner together, we talk story, we may be have opposing um, thoughts on this one project. You know, he's the head of Canada France, but hey, I respect him very much. Another good friend I made, Henry Yang, ch the chairman of the board of TMT. We can still con continue to have our conversations in a mutual and respectful way. So, All right, thank you very much, Lana Kila. Appreciate that. Uh, Lani, back to you. Mahalo, Riley. This one has to do with OHA financials, and you have 90 seconds, please. What is your position on releasing OHA's financial records, including unredacted minutes of meetings to the state auditor so that the OHA audit can be completed? Lanikila? Yeah, this has been an interesting one. So as the, the recent court case um, uh, that was just, uh, that just struck down the auditor's request uh, for the redacted minutes was based on that these are, are truly, um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I've lost the term. What do you call that? Uh, attorney privileges. Yeah, uh, forgot the terminology. Um, but the, 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 as for myself, uh, I would like to see uh, if, if that is truly what it is, then by law, they, it cannot be shared publicly. Um, though I think it's very important to note and look at everything that was collected. Um, and I think it's very important that um, the office itself um, the audit is only of any function if we if we choose to to move forward on any of the findings because as it stands right now nothing is 
technically illegal. There are red flags and myself, I'm very interested to know what those are. But I think it's responsibility as a, as a trustee, if there is any red flags shown in our paperwork, well, hey, we better be on that. That's our responsibility. So I think in the process of, of analyzing this uh, from within, I think it's important that uh, we do everything that is, everything legally to be as transparent as possible. Um, as that's one of the biggest things that or, or a lot of hardship with our communities and the relationship with OHA has been a, a lack of trust to open up as many doors as possible to let the light in is, is my cut you, of course, within uh, legal, legal grounds. Mahalo, Lana Kila. Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo. So on that specific issue, you know, the, the only ones that were part of that conversation were the trustees and their attorneys, right? So um, I can't provide any comments or input on that, but all of us have seen the results of it, right? The, the court ruled that um, it wasn't required to provide that. That was a court decision. Um, and in addition to that, I, I think it's important to, to recognize that OHA as an organization provided thousands of pages of documents to the auditor um, that would allow him and his office to fulfill the scope of the audit. Um, I fully agree that the scope of that audit should be completed. He should be provided the information that he needs to finish that audit. Um, and um, I believe OHA provided the necessary information for that to happen. In the larger picture, speaking in general, um, audits and financial transparency are obviously extremely important. And the office needs to take a look at what OHA has done historically and currently in terms of providing the information to the public and our beneficiaries. And if we can do more, we should. But again, on that specific issue, the courts ruled and I believe OHA has provided the necessary information for the auditor to complete their work. Mahalo. Mahalo, Keola. Back to Riley. All right, thank you, Lani. Uh, next question concerns homelessness and affordable housing. It's a 90 second question. Affordable housing is one of OHA's top strategic priorities. As a trustee, what will you do to address homelessness and truly affordable housing, especially among our native Hawaiian community? Please include any specific projects or programs you've been involved in to address the availability of low cost housing, starting with Keola, 90 seconds. Malo, so, you know, I was reading some statistics. The medium price for a home on Hawaii Island is $400,000. I believe the affordable, affordable housing range is, you know, in the 200, mid $200,000 range. That's still a significant amount of money for our people, right? even what federal guidelines define as affordable is still probably more money than I know I would have thought I would need for a house, you know, growing up. I think OHA has to start early with our people in teaching financial literacy, the importance of credit and um, get again, economic stability and educational sovereignty to get, you know, good jobs. Um, the challenge that native Hawaiians have, is that federal laws prevent Native Hawaiian housing preferences, right? With the exception of DHHL. So Native Hawaiians are competing in a pool with everyone else for affordable housing. So to me, one of the initial, and it sounds really basic, but the keys are gonna be in an economic position to be right up there with everyone to qualify for what's defined as affordable housing. DHHL, um, that's its own story, but I believe um, the wait list has to be resolved. Um, there's a huge beneficiary group for that. And in terms of homelessness and houselessness, um, OHA needs to work with direct service providers and subject matter experts on that topic to, again, figure out what role we can have in supporting them. Mahalo. Thank you, Kiola. Uh, Lanakila, same question to you to address affordable housing and homelessness. You know, um, I think financial literacy and education is essential for definitely to help to uh, for our families to be able to be better in managing their funds um, as one point on how to be able to uh, 
afford this. But I will say, as, as a young Hawaiian, it is ridiculous, the prices as it is going up. So I think what's also important is that we don't just try to try to just lomi lomi or, or help our people to, to meet this crazy rising standard or cost. I think we also need to address the, the, the source that this is not that just rising prices isn't just great real estate, that that's an issue, that's a problem. So we also have to address the problem. You know, uh, gentrification is huge over here. I, right here in Honoka'a, we have a house that I knew, I grew up next to it all the time. And, you know, it was just a regular house. It just got flipped and I just saw it on Craigslist for $3,000 a month. Who can afford that? Especially as a resident of Honoka'a, you know, in general, you know, you know, we see the cost of living going up, yet we see uh, um, pay rates are stagnant, the same as they were in the 70s. So we have, uh, I think OHA also has a responsibility to try and advocate as much as it can to, to, to leverage some types of caps or protections for, for taxpayers and, um, and, um, and to protect our local communities from this constant inflation or else we're just gonna to continue to see that grow, grow itself and we just, the people are just gonna to have to continue to fight for every little affordable housing that's built up. All right, thank you, Lani Kila. Uh, Lani, back to you. Mahalo, this one has to do with self-determination and sovereignty. You'll have two minutes each. Please share your thoughts on Hawaiian sovereignty. What path and actions can the Hawaiian people take for greater recognition and self-determination. Lanakila? I think again, that, that goes back to reminding us again when, when it was shared as the, the, the whole purpose and one of the primary purpose and reasons for the whole creation of OHA is to address the past injustices. This is part of those past injustices that the sovereignty of the Native Hawaiian people was stolen from us. Okay? So if you aren't sure with that, please educate yourself on Hawaii's history. Self-sovereignty, um, Self-governance, it's exactly like it's self-intended. I think when it comes to um, self-determination, it, it is for the Native Hawaiian people, and it is not meant to have any oversight by the state or have to receive the approval of anybody else. That's not self, um, uh, self-determination. It's something that we need to govern. Now, OHA has come under fire a lot in its prior actions of building a um, um, building up a, a role and, and then the Yaupuni situation. So I think and the, a lot of the, the, the bitterness again in that is that a lot of these things are being done in tangent with the state. But again, if you look to the history, the state is the recipient of the overthrow of, of, of the injustice. So for Native Hawaiians, you know, anything that has state's hands involved with it it's, it's tainted. So I think where the best thing that OHA can do, and as, as OHA is a quasi-state entity, um, it is still part of the state. So in that, I think OHA has a very important responsibility to, to assist in education to our community and help to provide um, perhaps platforms, but for the community to have their conversations, for us to have our con conversations and um, uh, to help to move forward in that. So I think OHA can, is, should not be a leader in this, but uh, just a, an assistant to the community and allow the Lahui to truly self-determine and come together and have those communications. How can it help to, to support those conversations in a Pono way? Mahalo, Lana Kila. Keola, two minutes. Mahalo. I think one of the biggest things that OHA can do to prepare our people for that continue or to support our people in that continuing discussion on sovereignty and self-determination is get our people healthy, address our health issues, address our educational issues, address the housing issues, and get our people economically stable. The challenge we have when we're having these conversations is that in all four of those categories, we're struggling, right? That how can you get into a discussion on that big picture topic when you're worrying about your rent, where your health is going, how your kids are gonna be educated? I think OHA for a long time has tried to do many things, um, but has struggled to move the needle historically. And I think we're finally at the point where if we can focus in on those core issues that will really affect people's lives and address them, 
it'll help our people be in a position to have that converse to continue that conversation because it's a continuing conversation on self-governance we have 600,000 native hawaiians according to the last census 300,000 roughly live here 300,000 live apart we have a broad range of opinions and views and and topics on on so many things but once we reach a point where we've addressed those four core issues, I think OHA's best role is going to be convening and allowing our people the space to have that conversation. The issue becomes, however, is that at the, when it comes to the federal government recognizing Native Hawaiians, that opportunity always seems to flare up and calm down. Um, depending on what your hope is come November, there could be an opportunity there. But the Native Hawaiian community needs to sound in clearly whether that opportunity should be pursued or we need to have that conversation as a people. Mahalo. Okay, uh, Lani, I'm going to take over on the next set of questions here. Uh, this is a multi-part question. We're going to start with Keola. The first one is 90 seconds. Uh, what changes or improvements would you like to see to occur within the Office of Hawaiian Affairs? Keola, 90 seconds. Mahalo. So we touched on it earlier, um, increasing opportunities for communities, not only in Waimea, North Hawaii, and Hawaii Island in general, but all, all communities across the state to have regular input and communication with OHA on issues that are of concern to them um, and issues of importance so OHA can understand how we can help. Like I touched on earlier, um, I think it's a challenging issue, but it's a simple formula. The more financial resources that are coming into OHA, the more that can go out to serve our Native Hawaiian community. And one of the biggest changes I, I want to do it, OHA, while maintaining our fiduciary responsibilities to the trust um, is increasing economic development, um, both on our commercial properties, but aggressively exploring other opportunities. The internet, alternative energy, agriculture, which includes ranching um, for folks in white male, which is obviously important. We need to figure out how we can support that and aggressively pursue it. Um, because I think it's been far too long that we've been dependent on others to provide that. And economic sovereignty means we shape our own economic future. And I think the time is now for OHA, and I look forward to supporting that moving forward. Mahalo. All right. Thank you, Kiola. Lana Kila, same question. What would you like to see change? What kind of change would you like to see occur within the Office of Hawaiian Affairs? Lana Kila, you have 90 seconds. I think definitely that the most one of the most important changes is that the office take what the, whatever necessary actions of change in order to bridge the gap between the office and their beneficiaries. And sort of the greatest converse, uh, the arguments that always takes place. There's such a dis, distrust and disconnection between the office and the beneficiaries. So we touched on it before about increasing our communication and increasing the presence of OHA in its community. Um, for many of us, I know on Hawaii Island, OHA tends to be quite Oahu centric. Um, and I, I, I really feel what, uh, what I would like to see the OHA it be more brave, you know, be willing to listen and take and work with their community instead of being subservient to the whim of the state. OHA is a quasi state entity was created with such a level of autonomy to be out to to be able to work more independently with the beneficiaries with Kanaka Maoli. So I, I really want to see OHA become more involved um, with their communities projects and not just um, uh, dropping down things down to the community to try and um, experiment and just we get more research out of it we we can we have to continue to sustain the trust but i think another concern is where many people will struggle to try and get access to the funds i think the process is so it's so cumbersome that we need to streamline a lot of the, the processes for people to even access the resources of OHA. all right thank you lana Kila. 
This is a shorter follow-up question concerning collaboration. I think all of us are aware of some of the divisiveness that has occurred between the various trustees. This first one is for Keola, one minute. How will you work with your colleagues to implement and improve collaboration? Mahalo. So, you know, the, the metaphor of the canoe certainly applies here. You know, I, I think it's obviously critically important that all of the trustees understand where we're taking this canoe to benefit our people and serve our mission and mandate. Um, and, you know, I'm open to listening, if elected, um, to all of the other trustees in terms of what they see um, the direction of the organization being, what their priorities are going to be. And I, I'll be happy to share mine with them as well. But at the end of the day, um, we have to understand that people want to see Hawaiians fighting with each other. And OHA can set a standard. We can change a course and really set an example um, for the world to show that, hey, we might disagree and we might want to do different things, but at the end of the day, um, we're one group working towards the benefit of our people, and we demonstrate that in statements and behavior. Mahalo. Thank you very much, Kiola. All right, Lanakila, same question on collaboration. How will you improve that? I think it's very important that the office um, and every trustee remember that their primary responsibility is to the beneficiary. And at many times, you know, this, um, that infighting that is OHA is so notorious for needs to stop. And I think it feels kind of odd for myself, probably stepping in as one of the, if I was to step in as one of the youngest trustees to have to tell older people, stop fighting. No, <laughs> it's Malama and take care of each other. No, um, being an ed educator for so many years and teaching quite a diverse uh, reach from preschoolers to 12th grade in the same day, you know, bridging that communication uh, and being able to articulate how it's important to malamakawa and how we speak to each other and that we have to set um, the, pri the, the priority of caring for our beneficiaries before our own personal, um, our personal gains. And with that, I can only echo what you saw happen on the Mauna. Kapu Aloha, we were able to stand in the most peaceful way. Uh, and if we can stay, keep that much people together and still work and communicate with even those opponents, then this office better follow in, in that example. All right, thank you very much. This is the last follow-up question. OHA's ability to, and it's a one minute uh, answer here. OHA's ability to respond to the needs of beneficiaries is severely hampered by lack of funding. What should OHA be doing better or differently to secure improved revenue sources and what would you do to achieve this? Keola? Mahalo. So the issue of justice and, and, and what is owed to Native Hawaiians through the public land trust revenue is out there. I'm committed to ensuring that Native Hawaiians get every penny owed to us by the law and by the constitution through public land trust revenue. But as I said earlier, um, as that issue is playing out, towards a day of justice and, and decision, um, OHA also has to continue moving forward with our own economic endeavors so we can shape our own economic future for our people. Um, the development of our commercial properties on Kaka'ako Makai, and again, thinking outside of the box, we all know how important the internet is for our people right now. This meeting wouldn't be happening um, without it, but I, I honestly believe that OHA should aggressively pursue and analyze the possibility of, of getting involved in being a provider of internet services. And then keep exploring other industries like alternative energy. It's not just the construction, but it's the maintenance, the operation and installation that we should take a look at. Mahalo. All right, thank you, Kiola. Uh, Lana Kila, same question to you concerning improving revenue sources. So make sure you're unmuted there, Lonnie Kilo, when you have a chance. Well, I muted myself. I thought I was unmuted. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's important to note, like, we're kind of going back to the COVID question, uh, we, we have seen now the essentials is what we lack. You know, um, so I think helping to, uh, as well as job security, providing and creating, helping to um, setting up the infrastructure to support 
uh, local industries that provide the essential needs for not only the Native Hawaiian community, but the community in general. Um, I think that is, is very, very important. I think it's very important to start moving forward to as well and helping to create more industries when it uh, comes toward environmental protection, restoration. Um, and with that, you know, I think, uh, I, uh, again, echoing what I said earlier on pursuing the technologies that help us to keep in alignment with Pono initiatives. Um, I invite you guys all to, to visit um, the Aina Aloha Economic Futures Initiative. I'm actually one of the, I'm actually the instigator and one of the original authors to that. And I think there's some great foundations inside there for us all to look at, at, at a Pono way of sustainable, healthy um, economic development. Uh, all right, thank you very much, Lanakila. That was the last question I'd be asking, but I just wanted to thank both of the candidates for your respect for each other and your respect for the time being allotted for each of you to uh, differentiate between the two of you so that voters can make an educated decision. Uh, Lani, back to you. Mahalo, Riley. Last question of the night, gentlemen. Accountability and accessibility. One minute to give a response, please. As an OHA trustee, what will you do to assure that you are accessible and accountable to your constituents? Uh, Lanakila? I'm an open book. Um, you know, I, I definitely plan to try, like I expressed earlier, to try and create um, from within, from within the office, a platform of, of, of communication, an open door platform for community to be able to come and speak to on my own personal. I know I want to make myself as available as possible, and I definitely intend to, um, especially to represent Hawaii Island, um, to Ka'apuni Lamoku quite regularly to visit and help to establish uh, a regular rotation of, of visits with the different communities, with our broad communities. Um, and whenever an opportunity arises to even expand that visitation um, <clears throat> onto the other islands. Um, I can only offer that um, I've always been open and willing to listen. It is, it is an honor to serve the Lahui, and uh, I think you can see in my record, uh, 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 that's the only way we can grow as a Lahui, is we have to not just make sure that we go out to tell and to speak to each other, but we have to ho'olono. And I say ho'olono, not no, just ho'olohe, because that's what we see happen with politicians too much. It's just lohe, but they don't really lono. So that's my promise to our Lahui. Mahalo. Mahalo, Lanakila. Keola? Mahalo. So, you know, as, as a person, I have way too much uh, respect to my family and my parents and the place I'm from, you know, not to be accountable or honest. So those kind of values have been instilled in me in day one and drive me in everything I do. And my commitment, if elected to this position, is that I'll bring those to the OHA board table every single day, um, every minute, and in every decision and in decision making, you know, I've, I've been um, at this for, you know, two decades now in, in you know, government and um, have had to do that consistently, right? And have lear and learned long ago that you better have a good basis for your decision if you're gonna stand up in front of a room full of people to tell them that, or um, you better be a fast runner to get out of that room if you don't, have a good uh, reason for making that decision. And I'm not fast, so um, <laughs> I've had good decisions. I've, I've had good reasons behind it. And, and I find that if, you know, even if people don't disagree, as long as you're truthful and upfront, they can at least respect you for telling the truth. Mahalo. Mahalo, Keola. Lanakila, Keola, thank you very much for joining us this evening and for the opportunity to talk story. Thank you, Riley. Thank you, James. Back to James. Well, thank you, Lonnie. Thank you, Riley. Appreciate that. And thank you, candidates. So as we approach the end of tonight's forum, uh, we'd like to give each of the candidates an opportunity to present some closing remarks. Uh, they'll be given two minutes. We'll begin our closing remarks with uh, Keola. And let me just make sure here. So Keola, I'm going to give you two minutes. And then uh, after two minutes, I'll pass it over to Lonnie Keela for his closing remarks. So Keola, when you're ready, your two minutes begins now. Mahalo. You know, growing up in and, you know, being from and having the privilege to work um, in the Native Hawaiian community for, um, you know, all of my life, there's been many profound and, and powerful experiences um, through that. 
Um, one of the most powerful ones is um, one day late in the afternoon, the, the knock on our office door and, and a family, you know, who had just become homeless was standing there. Um, and I'll never forget, you know, that, that, that father being there with his wife and, and his son and um, what he must have been going through. And it's kind of increased for me as I become a father and learning about that responsibility. And that idea of wanting to help people like that and many of, of our other people out there with so many different issues is what I wake up every day and look in the mirror. Um, no one's got a gun to my head, right? And I ask myself that, right? Am I ready to keep doing this? Am I ready for this commitment? And every day that I, I say yes, right? I, I've done that um, and, and keep doing it. And, and the minute I waver, and, and I'm not up to it, um, I know I kind of become a thief to my own people, right? And I keep doing that every day. I'm committed to helping, you know, Waimea and, and Hawaii Island and, and all of Hawaii um, work through issues um, respectfully, um, listening to everybody, trying to find a way forward because I think that's the last value I, I share that I feel that comes from our family is that we always found a way forward, right? No matter what the challenge was. Adapt to the times, no finger pointing, no excuses. Work hard and find a way to do it. And that's what I'll bring every day um, if given the opportunity um, to serve all of you as the OHA trustee. Mahalo. Mahalo Keola, thank you very much. And I would like to give two minutes closing remarks to Lana Kila. Lana Kila, please begin when you're ready. Now, was growing up here in Ahuaroa, um, you know, Ahuaroa Maoka, I live in the middle of the forest. I don't, my nearest neighbor is like a mile away. I spend a lot of time with Akumula Ao, with the, running in the forest, just me and the dogs. Um, and developed i've noticed and i've been told this by others what they've noticed is that developed an ear that listens not just to the words but to the intention and to the spirit um and to always to listen that's what ho'olono, to listen not just to find a response but truly to listen deeply and um my work that I have been blessed to do that has taken me to communities across the, across the world um, has, even myself as a, rec as a cultural practitioner, to know that you know, there's so much more to gain by sharing. There's so much more uh, strength in a community in our diversities. Um, and it's about finding that, like in the forest, there is so much different trees, yet when the wind blows, they all move in the same direction. So it's not about monocropping. We're not trying to make everybody the same. We all diverse, because you know, if it was all monocrop, it's not a healthy ecosystem. You know, so that's what we have to, we're striving to do. And for myself, um, it'd be an honor to continue to, to be this voice that represents one, and this, but also represents the pala, the sap, to help to bridge and bring community together um, and to be able to bridge that for my community and uh, beneficiaries to this office um, and really to bring that kapu aloha, that true aloha, not the tourist aloha, like the real kind aloha. And that's that respect to one another to move forward for benefit. So in this, if I have an opportunity to move forward as a trustee, it'd be an honor to serve and even to be able to work alongside uh, Keola in the office if I make it in there too. But Mahalo for Aloha everyone. Mahalo Thank you so much. Um, as we as we before we close tonight's meeting, I just want to make a couple brief announcements here. I'm just gonna share my screen here with everyone. Uh, so we still are planning to hold a, a virtual forum, a virtual excuse me, virtual town meeting. Uh, uh, on Thursday, November 5th, like as we normally do, our first Thursday of the month for Waimea Community Association. And we're looking to highlight our first responders as we do for our, for our uh, November meetings there. We're trying to look at a different capacity about how we can show our sincere gratitude and express our aloha for them. 
in some capacity, especially during this tumultuous year. Uh, we typically host a potluck dinner for our first responders in November, and we'll keep you in the loop about our plans as we finalize something in a virtual setting. And just something of note for tomorrow, uh, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, uh, and there will be a sign waving rally at Church Row here in Waimea to bring awareness and to break the cycle. So this event is hosted by the North Hawaii Domestic Violence Action Committee. Uh, please be sure to follow COVID guidelines. They will be adhered to there. So please bring a mask and practice good physical distancing there. So just a couple announcements there to share with you. And then I'm just gonna pop up the rest of the group back here uh, before we say aloha one last time. Um, First of all, I just want to mahalo nui to the candidates for taking part in our general election, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, uh, Hawaii Island Trustee Virtual Forum. Mahalo keola, mahalo lanakila. Thank you so much for your time and spending us with this evening. I appreciate your time and, and your capacity to run and all the best to you in your campaigns. And mahalo I'm to- <laughs> Absolutely, you're welcome. Thank you so much. I also want to mahalo to Lani, Olson Chung and Riley Smith per, for presenting tonight's community questions. And thank you to the WCA board for your support in holding this virtual forums, virtual candidate forums, in an effort to inform voters as they consider their selection in the Hawaii general election on or before November 3rd. And please be on the lookout for your ballot packets. They are in the mail. And uh, please reach out to the Office of Elections, either here on the Big Island Elections Division, the county level, if you haven't received your ballots by the end of next week. And please be sure to mail those back as soon as you can, as soon as you fill them out. Um, your vote is very important and make sure it counts. Thank you to all to the viewers that have joined us on the live stream tonight. You are welcome to revisit and rewatch the recording on the WCA Facebook page or up on our YouTube channel uh, towards the end of this week here, possibly on this weekend. Um, you're welcome to watch these to help guide your decision. And on behalf of the Waimea Community Association Board, I wish you good health, be well, aloha.